our sermon today. Uh, just several quick announcements. It is December 4th. It is a busy time of year for you. It's a busy time of year for this congregation. And we have a lot going on that I just wanted to take a moment this morning and kind of fill you in on. We've, we've said a little bit about all of these things, but not a lot about any of them. So just kind of want to uh, update you on some of the things that are going on and get your involvement in many of these things uh, that we're doing. The first is Dinner with Santa. That is less than one week away. It is next Saturday night. You should have a paper in the seat near you with some information about this event. And it's been made possible by uh, many people in the community that are wanting to help with this, but there are still plenty of ways for you to help, and your help is needed. Uh, we need some more elves, and, and what that means is you're just kind of helping uh, that night with the families that will be here. Uh, there are four families from this area that are coming, and it's an opportunity for us to help them. You can go on to the next slide there, and it kind of tells us this is an opportunity to help those in our community. And uh, there'll be four families that we're going to be serving, and we need some people to help with that. So if you could be here uh, by 2.30 p.m., if you can help with that. If you can't hear, be here by 2.30 but plan to participate, please be here no later than 4. Could you go to the next slide? And uh, this event will start at 4.30. Dinner will be served at 5.45. And uh, please have food here by 5 o'clock if you're not going to be here the whole time. Uh, pans with food items will be handed out after services today. And these include mashed potatoes and corn and carrots and mac and cheese. And if you'd like to contribute money towards this event in lieu of food or toward the purchase of gifts or other needs, that is also appreciated. So there are a lot of needs. There are a lot of ways to help and, and sign up with this. We're reaching out to some families in our community and the apartments that we serve. And uh, they ask the apartment managers, who wouldn't have a Christmas without us? And these are the people that are going to be here. People that wouldn't have a Christmas without you, people that wouldn't have a Christmas without us. So if you can help with this at all, uh, Stephanie will be situated out in the foyer after our services today. If you're visiting with us and you don't know who Stephanie is and you want to help, she's right there waving her hand. So uh, she'll be out at the Welcome Center after services to answer any questions that you have. Uh, we also have our Christmas program coming up on December the 18th, and we still need carolers for this. Uh, if, if you are inclined to sing and you like singing Christmas carols, please see me or Sherry. And Sherry, you can wave your hand now so they'll know who you are if they're visiting. And we'll let, we'll, if you're visiting with us and you like to sing Christmas songs, well, hey, uh, we're all for you helping. And uh, we're going to meet the first time this Wednesday night at 545. We're going we're gonna to sing together and practice a few songs. So if you can help with that, please uh, let me know or let Sherry know after services today. Or to show up Wednesday at 545, either way. Um, also, this is a great opportunity for you to bring your neighbors especially those of you who are going to have kids or teens in this program. That's an opportunity to invite grandparents, aunts, uncles. So let's just uh, make sure we have as many people as we can here on December the 18th at 6 p.m. Of course, Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., we're going to be having a Christmas Eve service. And again, this is a great opportunity for our community to come in. Uh, it, it's amazing how many people just choose this night to go to service somewhere. They're going to see a sign out front that we're having a service here. And our purpose that night is going to be to take those who don't really know the true story of Jesus, the full story of Jesus, we're going to try to take them from the cradle to the cross and really impress upon them the importance of Jesus being a part of every day of their lives. So make sure uh, you invite as many people to that as possible. Uh, Christmas Day services, of course, same time, same place. Uh, no Bible classes or NBCs that day, though. We will have some flyers for this, some cards for this, uh, probably by next week, Trey, you think, um, out in the foyer that you can pick up and take to people and invite them to come. We're also doing a mailing to about 700 houses right here near the building. So uh, let's be keeping all of this in our prayers. I also want you to be thinking about beginning next Sunday, we're starting a new sermon series kind of coincides with uh, the beginning of the season, and this is called Knowing Jesus. And I want to encourage you to be here for these lessons uh, beginning on next Sunday. 
This is going to be about a six-month series. I, I think I have a slide for this one, don't I? Yeah, I thought I did. This is going to be about a six-month series, and it will begin uh, next week by looking at the nativity and, and the fact that Jesus was born and brought into this world, and, and we'll be talking about God with us in December. In January, we'll move on to talking about Jesus being about his father's business, what was his purpose here on this earth. We'll look at Jesus in February as the master teacher, in March as the powerful servant, in April as the lover of our soul, in May his mission is our mission. Now this is not an expository study of the harmonized gospels, that would take six years. Um, this will only take us about six months, but it's a great opportunity for us to either re-familiarize ourselves with, with who Jesus really was, or find out really for the first time who Jesus Christ really is. So, if you're not out of breath from all the things that are going on here and uh, the many things that are happening, it's an exciting time, but it can be a little bit of an overwhelming time. So let's take just a moment before we get into our sermon this morning and just place it all at the Father's feet. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the opportunities you give us to serve you. And Father, it does seem a bit overwhelming, everything that's happening. Uh, during this time of year, not just here at, at Mandarin, but also in our own personal lives. We have families to see and trips to take and presents to buy and, 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 and children to have at soccer practice because they never stop that. And, 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 and Father, just so much going on and we feel so busy. Father, help us this morning during our time together just to take a moment to be still, to know that you're God. Help us take a moment every day, Father, just to be still and recognize that you are in control. Help us take all of these, these events, these programs, these ministries that we're involved in this time of year at Mandarin, and help us, Father, just to give them to you, to realize that you're in charge, that they're in your hands. And, Father, just help us to be still and know that you are God. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning as we conclude our series of lessons on transition, and we're talking for the second week about navigating church transition. I want to begin just by asking you a rhetorical question. And it's not a question we ask very often, but the question is, what do you expect from this church? I just want you to think about that for a minute. What do you personally expect from this church? And as you mull that around in your mind, I want to remind you of some of the depressing statistics that I shared with you last week that you were hoping I wouldn't bring up again. And that is that 80% of churches in America are either at a plateau or in a decline. And out of all the other 20%, only 5% are baptizing over five per year. And millennials, ages 18 through 35, only attend, only 15% of them attend church in America. Those are depressing statistics, but they're important for us to understand as we jump into what we're talking about today because we are in a time of transition where we're going to have to figure this out if we really want the church to survive into the next decade or so. Because... People will turn out by the thousands to go to a concert or a movie or a ball game. You know, there's a movie coming out in a couple of weeks called uh, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Just another way for Disney to make more money now that they bought the franchise. But I guarantee you that the night that opens on that Thursday night, there will be a line around most movie theaters to watch it. People turn out by the thousands for things like that. But I didn't see a line around our building today. Matter of fact, you don't see a line around many church buildings. And the question is, why? And I think one of the reasons, maybe one of the most significant reasons, is an absence of vision. Many churches have no life because they have no hope. And they have no hope because they have no expectancy. And they have no expectancy because they have no vision. And they have no vision because many times 
the leaders simply haven't instilled it. And the proverb writer tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, that where there is no vision, the people perish. You see, vision, like expectancy, always hopes for something better. It expects it. It believes it. It even demands that something better will happen. Can do is vision's theme. The impossible dream is its theme song. And the motto of vision is, you know, we'll do the difficult right now, but the impossible may take us a little while. That's, that's what vision is. So let me ask you that question again. What do you expect from this church? Now, let me make a statement that will let you know where I'm going with this. If we set our expectations too low, we will always hit them and be satisfied with our efforts. I'm serious. If we set our expectations too low, we'll always hit them. And we'll be satisfied. We'll be like, well, look what we did. We got it done. But here's the question. Is God satisfied? And what does God expect from this church? You see, God has placed us all here for a common purpose, and now it's time for us to know what exactly that common purpose is. And once we figure out what that common purpose is, it's time for us to act on it. It's time for our faith to become sight and for dreams to become reality. It's time for God's purpose to become our purpose and our priority to become fulfilling God's purpose. Now, you notice I've said God's purpose over and over and over again. And let me tell you why you need to understand that. And I'm going to try to say this in a very loving way. We are not here to fulfill your purpose. It's not why we're here. Your likes, your dislikes, sorry. They really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. And I'm not trying to be rude, I'm trying to be biblical. Because what matters is God's purpose. Now let me, let me say something else just so you won't get uncomfortable. We're not here to fulfill my purpose either. As noble as our purposes might seem, that's not why the church exists. So as we go through this transition, purpose is a word that we need to familiarize ourselves with. Purpose is a word that, that, that we need to constantly talk about and think about and, and, and really focus in on. And we need to make sure that that purpose is a common purpose and that we all have the same expectations and that we're not all running in different directions. And to find that common purpose, I want us to spend a little time this morning in chapters 3 and 4 of Ephesians. And we're going to kind of read these passages as we go. We won't read both chapters, just bits and pieces here and there. But when Paul writes these words, he's talking to a young church that needed to be reminded of her common purpose. A church that needed to be reminded that they had a common power source. You see, that power source that he reminds them of is a source that comes in three forms, if you will. It comes in the form of the revelation of the word, verse 2 of chapter 3, if indeed... You have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. You see, this book, not Glenn's opinions, not, not a, a statement set down and, and, and written out by those in leadership, but this book is God's instruction manual for the church. Okay, that was a pause for you to say amen. This book is God's instruction manual for the church. Amen. Do we believe that? Do we believe that this book holds 
what we need for this church to grow. You see, so often, one of the reasons that we struggle finding a common purpose is because we outsource our instructions. We look at culture. We look at business models. We look at what other churches have done and been successful with. We look at our traditions. We look at the book of first opinions and second opinions and third opinions. But yet, Paul told Timothy that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for what? For doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction. We have a common power source in the revelation of the Word. And we have a common power source in the grace of the Gospel. Everything that we are and everything that we can ever hope to be is because of the power of the gospel. It is because of the grace of God. We are saved by grace through faith, Paul said a chapter earlier. Not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And I think that's Paul's way of getting them ready for what he was saying in chapter 3 because he wanted them to understand, it's not about me. And it's not about you. Let me tell you something. I, I, sometimes I wonder if y'all put too much faith in me in bringing me here to be your minister. Because I hear over and over again, oh, you're going to help us, you're going to help us, you're going to help us, you're going to help us. Confession. I don't have the power to build this church. I don't. Don't lay that on me because I can't do it. And you can't either. But we're all equally connected to someone who can. And only by the power of grace, only by the power of the gospel, can we be what God wants us to be. And church, that's why he gave us this third power source, and that's through his spirit. The power of his Holy Spirit working in us. Verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, and the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. The only way that we can connect to one another, the only way that we can fulfill God's purpose in this place is that if we are filled up with the Holy Spirit of God. You know, there's a, there's a little book in the Bible called Acts. In that little book, we often refer to as the Acts of the Apostles. And that is correct. But if I had it all to do over and if I was on the book naming committee back in the third century when they gave them all names, if I was on the book naming committee, I think I would have called that one the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because although the apostles were involved, they were working through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why they were unstoppable. When I read about the early church, when I read the book of Acts, I see a church that is just unstoppable. Man, when I look at the 21st century church of Christ, we are just so stoppable. We are so distracted. And we allow ourselves to get discouraged and give up just like that. And the reason is because we are trying to achieve what is of God by human effort. 
you know, Paul told the church at Galatia in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3, are you so foolish that after beginning with the Spirit, you are now trying to attain your goal by human effort? By human effort. You know, we allow the Spirit to sanctify us and save us when we're baptized, but then we kind of try to do the rest on our own. And the word that Paul uses to describe this kind of logic is a Greek word that we translate as foolish, but the Greek word is idioso. I don't even have to translate that one, do I? (laughs) Paul says that when we allow God's Spirit to sanctify us and save us, and then when we try to do the rest with our own human effort, that it's idiotic that if we started with the Spirit, we need to continue with the Spirit. And we need to connect to that common power source. And then we need to sit ourselves around a common place setting. We are one body in Christ. Verse six of chapter three, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Skipping to chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and patience and showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You hear that about patience? Are we always patient with each other? Don't answer that. What about that part about being gentle with one another? Do we always say things to one another in the most gentle way that we should? Sometimes we just spout. And Paul is saying that if we want to be one with one another, we need to stop spouting. And we need to start plugging into the Spirit. And we need to recognize that the oneness that we have is not because of anything that you did. And it's not because of anything that I did. Unity is of the Spirit. And if we are walking in the Spirit, we will be unified. So what's the flip side of that? If we're not unified, we must not be walking in the Spirit. It's kind of simple when you think about it like that. You see, just because we have this oneness in the Spirit, though, don't misunderstand that to mean that we won't ever have differences. We're going to have differences. Chapter 3 and verse 2 tells us that God apportions his gifts differently. And if someone has a gift or a talent in the church, let me say this, this kind of a side note here. We need to allow people to use their gifts. Just because you've always been doing that, or just because it kind of fell on your shoulders, if there's someone that comes along and can help you with that, let them. It's important. Not only for them, but for you and to help them grow in their faith, and you to grow in your faith. But here's the thing that happens so often in the church. Sometimes we don't get the gift we wanted. It's like that Christmas morning tray, you wanted an Xbox 360 when they came out, and you wanted it so bad, and you got down under the tray, and your dad went to a yard sale and bought you a used Atari. You were so mad you couldn't stand it. That didn't happen, did it? Okay, good. (laughs) Trey would be like, how'd you know about my childhood? Um, I'm trying to forget all that. But, that, that, I mean, that happens sometimes. Sometimes we don't get exactly the gift we wanted, and therefore we end up trying to use a gift that we don't really have. Kind of like Barney Five singing Santa Lucia, you know? He really wanted that gift, but the fact is he just didn't have it. And we don't need to be jealous of what others have. We need to be blessed and use what God gave us. 
You know, when I was a kid, we always, every Sunday, we had one or two meals, fried chicken or ham. And, and my dad was an elder, and very often he would do something that would irritate my mother greatly. He would invite people over for lunch without letting her know first and without asking her if there was going to be enough food for guests. And on those Sundays, he said, don't worry, sweetie, I've got it. I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. My dad would apportion the chicken. He would, he would not just pass the plate around. He'd say, pass me your plate, I'll give you a piece of chicken. So he'd make sure everybody got a piece. I was the youngest child. I always got either the wing or the neck. <laughs> never failed. And I was never really pleased with, with what I got because it didn't fill me up. Here's the thing. In the church, you may not be pleased with the gift that you've been given, but I guarantee you if you accept it and use it, it will fill you up. It will. We all need to work together and use the talents that God has given us. That's why it's called unity of the Spirit. See, all these, all these things like conceit and provoking or envy even, they're impossible when we're walking in the Spirit. Impossible. You know, we, we find unity in our differences because we recognize that even though we may have different gifts we all have some gifts in common we have the gift of grace in common we have the gift of the word in common we have the gift of God's Holy Spirit in common like we mentioned earlier and because of that commonality we should be able to wrap ourselves around a common purpose. So what is the purpose of the church? What is a common purpose statement for the church? Well, in chapter 3, in verse 10, we, we, we don't have to have little subcommittee meetings to come up with a purpose statement. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have to have uh, focus groups to come up with a purpose statement for the church because we've been given one already. And it's Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose. There it is. That's the purpose of the church. Period. Period that the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. That's the purpose of the church. That's why we exist. We don't need to have special little meetings to come up with a purpose. We've got one. And that's important for us to understand. It's important for us to understand what the purpose of the church is. Now, now one thing, some translations say purposes. I want to tell you that those translations are wrong. They are. If you look at the original Greek, this is singular. And it means we have one purpose. You know, if my brain tells my legs that my purpose is to go forward, and this leg decides to obey my brain, but this leg decides to go the other direction, I'm, I'm about as limber as a dead oak tree. So... It's not going to end well for me, okay? The church has one purpose, and the head of the church, Jesus Christ, has said that the purpose of the church is to move forward and make known the manifold wisdom of God. And if all of a sudden, another faction of the church decides, no, we don't want to go that direction, we want to go this direction, it's not going to end well. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians we talked about last week. Chapter 12, verse 25, where Paul says, there should be no schism in the body. That's the King James. And, and I like using that word because it automatically brings to mind the thought of, of being schizophrenic. And, and, and basically what that means is going in too many different directions at one time. You know, I... 
I've been here about six weeks now, and maybe this is too soon for, the, for me to say this, but if I can see one glaring weakness in the Mandarin church so far, and I'm just, I'm just leveling with you folks, it's that we're a bit frantic. We're a bit frantic. We are moving in a lot of directions. And, and don't get me wrong, all of these works are good works. But many of them are very rushed. And are they connected to a common purpose? And are they even able to be accomplished to the greatest of their effectiveness with the manpower we have and the other things going on? And often what happens when we get frantic and maybe we try to put too much on our plate is that we end up having poor communication. That's never a problem, is it? People get left out. Things get put off to the last minute. And the hardest workers in the church just get burnt out. You know, every Sunday when I come before you to preach, I sit down on Tuesday. I look at my text and I say, what do I want to accomplish with this sermon? What is my aim? And it's usually one sentence long. This is my aim. This is what I want to accomplish. And then I begin to work on the sermon. And as I work on the sermon, I might see something on TV. I might hear an illustration. I might see a video and think to myself, that's brilliant. i got to fit that into my sermon. And I start trying to fit it in. And then I see that statement again, that aim. And I go, man, this is such a good story. It's such a funny joke. I really want to tell it. But it has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon. So what do I do? Wad it up throw it away. Because as good as it might be, it's not going to help me accomplish my purpose. We need to be a church with an aim. We need to be a church with a purpose and a target. Because that's what's going to help us through transition. If we act on purpose. Let me tell you something. Church growth is not an accident. It happens on purpose, but it happens on God's purpose. So often our purposes are different. Our purposes for our lives, our purposes for the church, they just get completely out of sync with what God wants. And then we begin to wonder, well, why isn't church growing? And, and why aren't I growing spiritually? Have you ever wondered if maybe, and, and, and this might be radical, but if maybe, we just need to get out of the way and let God do what he does. You ever think that maybe that might be a good thing? And I'm not just talking about the church, I'm talking about our lives. Like I was praying in the prayer, sometimes we just need to be still. Sometimes the most beautiful things can be accomplished when we are doing nothing but letting God work. So how do we do that? How do we get out of God's way and let him go to work? Well, I want to answer that by giving you a little quiz. How well do you know the following people and organizations? Um, some of you might know, I, I don't know, um, Jack Tinker and Partners, Doyle Dane and Bernbach, BBDO, Foot, Cone, and Belding. J. Walter Thompson, you ever, you ever heard of some of those? You're a lawyer, you're not allowed to nod your head. How many of you knew all of them besides him, besides Grant? None? Okay. How many of you knew one of them? One, okay. I imagine that if you didn't know it, that the people on this list are actually quite pleased by that because advertising agencies don't exist to make a name for themselves they exist to make a name for others so you may not know these names but do you know these slogans first one plop plop fizz fizz oh what a relief it is you know that some of you younger ones might not 
But Jack Tinker and Associates came up with this phrase in 1976, and still to this day, Alka-Seltzer uses that phrase. What about this one? We try harder. Avis started using that phrase in 1962, and they still use it to this day, and it was written by Doyle, Dane, and Burbach. What about this one? Mmm, good. Campbell's Soup, Soup still uses it. But BBD&O came up with that slogan in 1935. Here's one I bet you've heard of. When you care enough to send the very best. In 1934, Foot, Cone, and Belding came up with this slogan. And what about this one? You know this. Snap, crackle, pop. If you eat Rice Krispies or make Rice Krispie treats, you know that one. Did you know that this phrase was, this, this slogan was crafted in 1928 by a man named J. Walter Thompson? See, we could learn a lot from these companies because what they do for their clients, we exist to do for Christ. We are heaven's advertising agency. We promote God's purposes in every area of our lives. But we can only do that if we push all personal aspirations aside, all personal agendas aside, and focus on God's intent for the church. And when we do that, <laughs> Paul says it best, when we do that, listen to what happens. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen when we do that he will do immeasurably more than all we can ask or even imagine and that church is good news. Let's pray. Father, we are so incredibly grateful for the church. But Father, our prayer is that you would help us daily to remember why we're here. To help each of us to step down from any personal agendas or purposes that we have and focus solely on the one purpose that you have for this church, and that, that is that we would make known your manifold wisdom. Father, we pray your blessings upon every endeavor that we take as a church towards that purpose. But Father, we also pray that when our purposes aren't fulfilling your purposes, that you would defeat us. But when our purposes are fulfilling your purposes, that you would strengthen us, that you would empower us, that you would bless us. And Father, we know in reality this isn't something we even have to pray for. Because you have promised that when we are working according to your purpose, that your church will grow. And Father, we thank you for that promise. And we pray, Father, that we will believe it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we wrap up this morning, I just want you to ask yourself some, some questions. Just in your heart. What's your purpose? What do you exist for? I mean, in relation to this church, why did God place you here? Because he did. I mean, he was, he was involved in every little bit of that. So why has God placed you here? And maybe a more important question is this. What do you need to personally push aside to be able to fulfill the purpose for which God placed you here? Maybe you need to push aside personal agendas. Maybe you need to push aside some personal struggles that you're having. 
some battles with sin, some battles with self, some battles with doubt. Maybe you need to make that first step in becoming a Christian by being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the reception of his Holy Spirit because if you don't have his Holy Spirit, you don't have his power. And if you don't have his power, you can't fulfill his purpose. So if we can help you with any of those things today, if we can pray with you, pray over you, baptize you into Christ, we would be glad to help you if you would come to the front while we stand and sing this song. Let's all stand. When we walk with the 